we're going to talk about the Oregon healthcare revolution and how you guys are going to do it. Um, and we found the problem, big insurance. For good reason, economists are not always welcome. We have a lousy sense of humor. Um, there are three jokes in the economics profession. At most, one is funny. Um, uh, the other thing is, we always say the same thing. Econ economists think that everything would be just fine and dandy. The, if, may, if not fine and dandy, as close to fine and dandy as is possible. As good as can be, subject to the constraints of factor endowments and technology. If only everybody would use markets. The solution to all problems is to commodify things. Make it into a commodity that people buy and sell, and let people buy and sell it. And then, if you like it, you'll buy it. If you don't like it, you won't. The price will be set in the market so that things sell at the cost of production. If you are not willing to pay that much, well, you shouldn't have it anyway. If you're not willing to, if you don't value it as much as it costs to make, yeah. and everything will be just fine. So they go around looking at the world. Why is it that some things aren't fine? It's because we're not using markets. When we haven't turned everything into a commodity. When it comes to health care, you look at health care. Why is it it's going up in price? Why is it that people are unhappy about the quality of their care? It must be that it's because we're not using markets. Because we know that if you use markets, it would all be fine. So the solution is to turn health care into a commodity, which basically means doing away with the insurance function and public subsidy of health care. Because those are the things that let you get health care without paying the full price on the margin. Yeah. You use too much health care because you're not paying the full price. You are abusing health care. You want to control the cost of health care? Cost sharing. Even better, full cost pricing. Have people pay for their health care and they won't abuse it. More co-pays, more deductibles, more competition among more insurance plans. So insurance will basically turn into something where you pay the full price of whatever you're doing right away. Some of you might, not, might say that's not insurance. And you know what? You're right. Um, so anyway, economists have been pushing this since the early, late 60s, early 70s. Um, I'll name some names, or at least one name. Um, but this is what you've got to thank the economics profession for. You know. Co-pays, deductibles, ever more complicated health insurance, because this is what they've been pushing. Now, I'm not like other economists. Um, you know, there's actually a book, about, thank you, there's actually a book about my economics department um, at the Edge of Camelot by Donald Katzta. Uh, it describes what, UMass Amherst Economics was founded, I mean, there was a department there before, but nobody cares. Um, what happened was Harvard fired all its radicals in one night. All they could fire, fire. Steve Moglin already had tenure. <laughs> You know, um, anyway, they fired all the rest and they packed up and moved to Amherst, UMass Amherst. Um, I, was, I was so stupid and naive, I, I mean, I still am, it's not just past tense. But, you know, so I went there thinking that all these people were still at Harvard. And no, lo and behold, I found that, oh, last year they all left, you know, or pushed out. So anyway, I hung out at Harvard because I had other interests anyway. Um, and then when the time came, I moved out to Amherst, UMass Amherst. So, yeah, that's how I got there. But we're different. I'm different. And in this case, I don't think healthcare is like other commodities. I don't think buying healthcare for that little baby is like buying a pair of Nikes. Are those Nikes? Adidas. Whatever. Whatever they are. I don't know. Okay. They should have been Nikes. Uh, anyway, I don't think healthcare is like shoes. And using the market has been inequitable destructive, and has led to even more waste. Okay, where are we going? We're going to talk about U.S. healthcare spending, healthcare outcomes, healthcare disparities. Our healthcare outcomes are bad, 
at least in part because we have such disparities. Some of those disparities are right here in Oregon, and we'll talk about those. Why markets give you a little bit, not too much, but you know, some economic theory about why markets can't solve our healthcare problems. And then we'll talk about what is to be done, what has been done through the Affordable Care Act, and what should be done in following up on the Affordable Care Act with single payer, nationally and in Oregon. Um, okay, now, one of the central arguments among people, economists, who in the 70s were urging commodification of healthcare was the argument that healthcare consumption is consumption activity by consumers. When you go to the doctor, you're not doing anything useful because doctors don't do anything useful. <laughs> Your doctors don't make you healthy. What you do when you go to the doctor is you're consuming health care. You're not a sick person, you're not a needy person, you're a consumer. Just like when I go skiing, I buy a lift ticket, I am consuming skiing. When I go bowling, I rent shoes, I rent a bowling ball, I throw it down the lane, I am consuming bowling. Or, you know, one day I don't feel like skiing or bowling, I go to the doctor. Yeah. Um, Richard Zeckhauser came to a seminar that I attended in 1981, and he sat down and he explained that health care, that everything doctors do, everything they've done for 100 years has done nothing to improve life expectancy or make people healthy. On the contrary, people go to doctors because it's cheap due to insurance and because they like going to the doctor. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I go to the doctor all the time. I sit in the waiting room and I read his magazines. I don't need to see him. You do simple analysis of healthcare outcomes. And the simplest analysis should have raised the question. Because if you look at life expectancy, here I'm looking at female life expectancy. I could have looked at male, it would have the same results. The reason I do female is the numbers are larger because women live longer than men. Yeah, each of these dots represents a country, per capita income, life expectancy. Guess what? Per capita income goes up, people live longer. That should not be a surprise. And Zeckhauser would say, oh, that doesn't mean it's because of health care. It means that they have more income, they buy more food, they have better quality heating, housing, water. Okay, could be, could be. Thing to note here. Which country is really not doing that well? Not doing as well as it should, given the income level of the country? The United States. Yes, you got it. Chocolate for you, chocolate for you. Yeah. Over here is the United States. We are like three years below the line. We should have three more years of female life expectancy and three more years of male. You're given our income level. Okay, you know, it's like, there could be all sorts of reasons why we're not doing Maybe, even though we're rich, we're not buying health care. Maybe we're not spending enough on health care. Oops. <laughs> Look over here, the United States. We spend so much more on health care than everybody else that it's almost funny. I said economists have a bad sense of humor. You know, this is the kind of thing economists kind of laugh about. They look at this graph and say, <laughs> look at that. Look at all that big number. Like $8,500 per person on health care in the United States. Country number two, Norway, where they've got all that gas and, um, and Jarlsberg cheese. I mean, it's like, you know, they spend a little more than half what we spend. You know, you go to the next country, Switzerland, you know, cheese cuckoo clocks, banks, 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 they spend about the same, 5,500. You keep going, I mean, you've got all these rich countries. Nobody spends anywhere near what we spend. And you know, you're not just talking about Turkey, Mexico, Estonia, you know, all these countries down here, very little money. But these are rich countries. Belgium, France, Sweden, nobody's spending anywhere near what we spend. 
Um, and yet, ooh, 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 there we are. Female life expectancy at birth, you already saw this from the other graph, but there you have it. Look who's good, Japan. France. Yeah, it is so unfair. <laughs> good croissants, the Louvre, um, the Côte d'Azur, my book, La Greve en Exil, <laughs> and 85 years of life expectancy compared to 81 in the United States. Yeah, that is so wrong. You know, and below us, who's below? There are some countries below us. But all the countries that we should be compared to have longer life expectancy even though they spend a lot less. You know, okay, part of it is people don't have health insurance. Here we have life expectancy at birth, including everybody, men and women. You know, I, I gotta fix this, because I could fix it. Um, the data source I had presents it like this, but I could, could have gone back to the OECD, so I apologize. But it doesn't really matter, you get the point. Life expectancy is lower in the United States. Here's the US. Part of it is, that we have all these people without health insurance. At the time that this, these data were collected, it's before the ACA went into a, you know, kicked in. This is 2010. And my estimate, this is an estimate, it's not an official number. My estimate is if you don't have health insurance during your entire life, your life expectancy is 70. If you do have life insurance, uh, sorry, health insurance, your life expectancy is almost 80. That's a lot better, right? it's still worse than every other country, even if you have health insurance. So part of the problem is too many people don't have health insurance. The rest of the problem is even with health insurance, Americans don't live as long as they should. Something is wrong with the way we are providing health care. Um, and here we have where Dick Zeckhaus is really wrong. I, I, I mean, I, I just love saying that. I love dumping on my professors. Um, it, you know, it brings out, I'm 58, I've been, I've been tenured forever, um, but it's still, I get that childish glee in proving those elders were wrong. Ooh, ooh. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like, you know, the guy in The Lion King who says, Mumfaza, ooh, shut up, you idiot. You know, okay, I am surrounded by idiots. You know, um, okay, here's, uh, annual health care spending, here's female life expectancy. What happens when you spend more? You live longer. It's not just that you're a richer country, it's that actually spending more increases life expectancy. What doctors do matters for some people, for some countries. Not so much for the United States. We should have four more years of life given what we spend. If we were like other countries, we would live four years longer. Or, you know, let's just say, okay, you know, we're just going to settle for this life expectancy. We should have $6,700 back. Looking at this audience, I suspect that the overwhelming majority would vote with me four more years of life. Um, you know, earlier today I was speaking over at the university and there were a bunch of students, students with college loans, students with grad school loans, students so far from being old that they don't really worry about it. I think they wanted the money. <laughs> yeah. But either way, we're not, getting, we're not getting either one. We don't get the money and we don't get the life. There's something wrong with what we're doing. Now, the other thing is about the, those young people, they might say, ah, oh, by the time things come along to, around to me, um, barring car crash or whatever, by the time I get old, um, life expectancy will be longer. And they're right. It's amazing. We've been increasing life expectancy in the advanced world. We're not talking about Mexico, where they're finally getting clean water in some villages. We're not talking about um, Egypt, where they're getting antibiotics in some places. We're talking about 
France, Germany, countries that 20, 30 years ago were already very prosperous, good health care systems, good public health. Life expectancy in France is up, but I think this is France, by four years. This is again for women, but you know, it's, you know, well, we're going to have to talk about it. Uh, actually, this is for men and women um, together. Uh, life expectancy in every advanced capitalist country has been increasing over the last 20 years. What doctors do matters. What doctors do keeps you alive. What doctors do that they didn't used to do makes you healthier. You know, and you can look at a whole range of diseases in the United States that you can point to and say, hey, people don't die of that as much as they used to. They don't die of breast cancer as much as they used to. Um, they don't die of colon rectal cancer. They don't die of heart disease as much as they used to. That's in the United States, the same in other countries. What's different is the United States is down here. We've had barely more than one year increase in life expectancy. While other countries, everybody else is more. They are all doing better than us, and they're doing better and better than us. And they're doing it while spending less money. The horizontal axis here is per cap change in per capita health care spending over the last 20 years. Guess who's spending the most more than 20 years ago? The United States. Guess who has the smallest increase in life expectancy compared to 20 years ago? The United States. The cost per year of life, the cost per year of additional life in the United States is close to $2,000. We've been spending $2,000 more for every additional year of life. Nobody is, is at our level. Many countries are way below it. Italy, they're getting another year of life for barely for less than $500. Other countries are doing much better than us in the level of efficiency of their increase in life expectancy. They are more efficient than we are. They get more life for less money. Now, you could talk about Oregon, and we have county data for Oregon. Um, if I knew the counties better, I could you know, name them off. But here we have counties ranked, sorted by per capita household, sorry, not per capita, sorted by household income. These two counties, I don't know how you want to characterize them, depending on how you feel about rich people in Portland suburbs, um, but that's them. Over here on the vertical axis, we have age-adjusted mortality. These two counties have the lowest age-adjusted mortality, except for, you know, there is random variation. You know, there's this guy down here. I forget who that is. Um, up here, you have Southern Oregon and Eastern Oregon, low-income counties, with high, relatively high mortality. How much higher? About twice, almost twice as high. As high. You know, the rich counties in the suburbs of Portland, age-adjusted mortality. So it's not like they have older people or, or anything like that. So this is controlling for that. Um, they have an a age-adjusted mortality rate of 250. The poor counties, over 400. Being in a rich county helps. Being rich helps disparities. Not only do we have a less effective health care system, people don't live as long, we have a less efficient health care system, we spend too much for what we get, we have disparities in the health care system. It's the poor and the working class who are getting it worst. Now, add to this, our spending is increasing increasing faster than other countries. If we had just been like the rest of the affluent capitalist world, if we had acted you know, like Canada, France, Germany, I mean countries that are doing fine in health outcomes, better than us, if we had acted like them, then we'd be spending $3,800 less per person. You remember before I talked about student loans? Not that many students would turn away $3,800 per year. Not to mention their parents thinking about sending kids to college. $3,800 per year. That's how much more we're spending than we would have been spending if we were like Canada. 
Yeah. If you're a family of four, close to $16,000. Yeah. What would you do with $16,000? Mm, go to Europe, buy a boat, and then next year, what would you do with the $16,000? Buy a house to go with your boat? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, rising healthcare costs have been eroding workers' wages. You know, back in 1970, you know, 1970 is a good year because that's when Tommy Douglas was the Prime Minister of Saskatchewan who brought single payer to Saskatchewan. It so impressed everybody in Canada that within six years, I believe it was, every province in Canada had adopted a single payer plan. Um, and it was a national plan by t in 1971. You know what they call it? Medicare. Medicare. Just to tease us. <laughs> yeah. They're still mad, you know. They're still mad about 1812. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, anyway, back then we, um, you know, healthcare costs came to about 6% of average wages in the United States. You know, you noticed it, but okay. By 2010, they were 20%. And then, with the Affordable Care Act, they're going to go up to 24%. How affordable is that? Um, I think the Affordable Care Act is great. Um, I love Obama. But the Affordable Care Act is not going to control costs. You know, affordable is a little, you know, it's not, maybe not the best word. Okay, here's wages, here's health care costs. To be sure, not everybody is suffering under this. We treat health care as a lump sum tax. Poll taxes are banned under the 24th Amendment to the Constitution. But that doesn't apply to health care. I pay the same amount for my health insurance for the same policy, I would pay the same amount as Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett uh, has, you know, I'm, you can look up my salary. Everybody who works for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there's a database online, you can find my salary. Um, and, but I'll, you don't have to do that, I'll tell you. I don't make as much as Warren Buffett. <laughs> yeah. So healthcare is a much higher share of my income than Warren Buffett's. That said, I'm still doing all right. You know, I'm kind of over here-ish. Um, what about poor people? What about people who work part-time and can't get full-time work? What about people working minimum wage? Millions of Americans are working minimum wage jobs full-time. Um, they're over here. And healthcare is a heavy burden for them. The same dollar amount applied to a smaller income. And it gets worse because they're not paying the same dollar amount. Why are some people down here, you talk about them, 20% of Americans? That's 60 million people. Many of them have disabilities, asthma, missing limbs, vets who lost parts of their body serving their country, serving our country. You know, all sorts of reasons. People who lost part of their mind, you know, people who have schizophrenia. Uh, people who have manic depressive episodes, all sorts of things that make it harder for you to earn much money. Those people end up down here, paying more medical bills out of less money. That comes from the way we finance health care as a lump sum tax on everybody. And talk more about that. Now, to control costs, as I said, you know, and you know. <laughs> Zeckhauser was part of this. He wasn't the only one. Um, you know, we've set out we're going to control costs by linking your access to health care to dollars, commoditizing your doctor visits, making it that you pay for what you get, which means that if you can't pay, you don't get. And this is what's been happening just since 2001. The proportion of Americans who report they had a medical problem but did not visit a doctor. They felt sick, they didn't go to the doctor. 14% in 2001 did not go to the doctor when they felt sick. 
We've got that up to 24% with rising co-pays and deductibles. That's 2010. I can promise you that number's higher now. Do not fill a prescription. I mean, I love this one because it's so clear. A doctor told you, take this prescription. Your blood pressure is high. Take this prescription to bring it down. You have um, a, a, you know, a strep throat. Take this penicillin or whatever. You need to take this prescription for your diet, you know, take this insulin, whatever it is. The doctor says take it, and you don't. In 2001, 18%, now we got that up to 24%. Don't take it. Or maybe they split the pills in half and stretch out one month to two. Maybe they take five of the antibiotic, five days of the antibiotic, put the rest away for next time. Yeah, how's that work? Skipped recommended test or follow-up. Did not get needed specialist care. Any of the above. We've gone from 29% reporting one of the above to over 40% reporting one of those above one of those problems. We have the most restrictive health care access for everyone. This is actually slight, somewhat different data, different year. 37% of Americans report access problems, 4% in the UK. 18% in France, half what we have in the United States. Canada, 13%. The United States is the most restrictive health care system for everyone, but it's especially restrictive for some. The uninsured, I, of course, this is not surprising. Over 60% of the uninsured report they have some access problem. But even, the, uh, even those with insurance, the rate is higher than in any other country. The Affordable Care Act is about bringing this coverage number down to here. Bringing this number down to here by extending health insurance coverage to more people. It's wonderful. It's wonderful that we can do that. After Romney Care was went into effect in Massachusetts. I was at the hardware store, Leader, on Route 9 in Amherst, if you want to go there. Yeah, it's a good place. Um, and the two women behind the counter were talking. I mean, these are obviously minimum wage type jobs. Um, and one of them said how, you know, God, this woman looked like she wasn't over 25 and she had a, like a five-year-old kid or something. Um, but not to judge, not to judge. Um, anyway, she said that uh, she, was, she signed up to the Connector, which is Massachusetts's exchange, health insurance exchange, with subsidies. And she was able to get health insurance. That really perked my ears. Um, and she said how she took her son to the doctor for the first time in three years. And I thought, that kid should be going to the doctor every year. I'm really glad that now we can do it. I was so happy I wanted to cry. Yeah. That's how I, that was my reaction when the Supreme Court made its decision. If I had paid attention to the implications of the decision on Medicaid, I would have cried. But OK. Um, anyway, uh, you know, at this point, maybe as much as 20 a million Americans who do not have health insurance have health insurance thanks to the Affordable Care Act. By the way, that includes both my daughters. Uh, well, uh, OK, we probably, I, I don't know what we would have done. You know, one of them's through the exchange, um, and one of them uh, is still on our plan, the younger one. OK, anyway, getting people insurance moves you from here to here. But even this is worse than any other country. It's not only whether you have health insurance, or it's not at all whether you have health insurance. The issue is not about health insurance, it's about access. That's what we care about. Having health insurance helps you have access, but it does not give you access. You can have health insurance with a high deductible. You can have health insurance with unaffordable cost sharing, high co-pays. All those things, you have health insurance, but as one of my colleagues said, you don't really know whether you have health insurance until you file a claim, and then you find out. Yeah. Up here, we have people dying in Oregon because they don't have access. You know, if you have a 22% without access, 
the death rate is double what it is in counties with 10% without access. Double the death rate. Here's nationally. 3,000 counties in the United States. The, the regression is almost identical. Oregon is representative of the whole United States in this. More access problems, higher mortality. The age-adjusted mortality, you know, here's the range for Oregon, and it's just the same nationally. Um, the more access problems, the higher mortality. If every county in the United States had the access problems of Britain, 4% of the population having access, cost-related access problems, the death rate would be 700,000 less. Now, I mean, that number is so big, that this prob it's probably too big. There's prob there are things I could think of that maybe should go into this. Maybe access here is filling in for other things. So maybe the number's not that high. But think about it. What is 700,000? A quarter of US deaths. If we reduced our death rate per year by one quarter, we would have life expectancy as good as Japan's. Why do Americans die young? Because they can't get to the doctor. Why can't they get to the doctor? They don't have health insurance, and their health insurance is too burdensome. Co-pays, deductibles, cost sharing are killing people in the United States. Killing a civil war death rate every year. Um, and we've made life something money can buy. There's that song, if life was something money could buy. Sweet Honey and the Rock sing it, I think. The rich would live... Oh, okay, I won't burden you with my singing. Um, but I will say this. Here are my siblings. In the richest 10%. Did I tell you about my brother's apartment? No, okay, I won't. Um, Four and a half years increased life expectancy for the richest Americans. 3.7 years for the next richest Americans, including tenured college professors at UMass Amherst. Um, the next group, you know, I'm not quite sure who, but you know, well-paid staff, I don't know. You know three, three years, 3.1 years. The average for the OECD is three and a half years. You have to be in the top 20% of the United States to have gained as much life expectancy as the average for the rest of the advanced capitalist world. And then you go along, wait, whoa, whoa, wait. It gets less and less and less. Over the last 20 years, we've been gaining less and less life expectancy until you get down to the poorest 10%. They have higher death rates lower life expectancy than 20 years ago. It gets worse, especially for the women in the audience, you know, the superior people. Here's men. This is the male life expectancy at age 55 by income group. The richest 20, richest 10 percent, this is for those, this is the rate for 20 years ago, people who are 55 20 years ago. Here's the rate today. So if you're wondering, you can put yourself in here, guys. Um, I am 58, so kind of almost the same as 55. You know, we'll just forget those three years. You know. And we say at my point, in, you know, over here, I should have 33 more years of life expectancy. OK, I'll take three away. I'm 58, not 55. OK, so okay, here's guys. Our life expectancy has increased. Here's women. This is why I try to make you feel good, because what I'm going to say now should make you feel really, really bad. Now, probably there aren't that many women in the bottom 40% in this audience, which is a good thing, because it's bad news. I mean, 40% of American women have shorter life expectancy than they did 20 years ago. What the is wrong with this country? All the technological improvements, better you know, health technology, Poor American women, low-income American women, you got up to 40 per, the 40th percentile, you know. That's getting pretty far up. It's not just the really poor. It's kind of low-working, pink-collar, you know, this clerk, 
the, the faculty secretary in my department, definitely in that group, their life expectancy has fallen since 1994. Yeah. That is appalling. Um, even, af even rich American women aren't doing as much better as is happening for men. You may have seen the story about this. It was like two weeks ago in the New York Times when this study came out. I thought it was kind of interesting that the Times made a big deal about it. I was glad. But the Social Security Administration did the same study five years ago. I literally substituted a different slide for the slide I had made from the Social Security Administration with the same thing. Um, but, you know, whatever. You know, people are talking about it. It's good. Okay. Uh, rationing by income. I mean, you could say, okay, women are dying, things are bad for some people, but, you know, at least we're saving money. Wrong. You know, I want that gong from the gong show it was in the 70s, whatever. Yeah, I never watched it, but it was such a cultural icon. You know, boom, wrong. Rationing by income fails even to control costs. And of course it fails to control costs. We know what causes rising health care costs in this country. The drivers, the things going up fast, are prescription drugs and the administration of the private health care system. Co-pays and deductibles don't address either of those. In fact, we'll jump ahead. They make everything worse because somebody's got to keep track of the co-pays. Somebody's got to keep track of the deductibles. And when we're making health care a commodity produced by for-profit companies, health insurance companies, they establish competing firms with more administration. And that's what's going on. Administrative bloat is suffocating our health care system. $200 billion on administration of the health insurers. $32 billion for companies. And the worst of all, the biggest cost, is what goes on in provider offices billing and insurance operations in hospitals. We have more people doing billing and insurance in most hospitals than we have beds. American doctors spend over $80,000 on billing and insurance related activities compared to $22,000 for doctors in Ontario. This is, this is what's driving up the cost of health care in the United States. You want a job in health care? You could become a doctor. There are 500,000 of those barely more than there were 50 years ago. You could become health manager, supervising the doctors. More than one manager per doctor. What on earth do these people do? You know, I guess they, you know, two of them go after each doctor. You know, we'll beat up the doctors together. You could become a nurse. That's a respectable, important occupation. I salute you. Plus, it's a great union. I love it. Or you could become office support. <laughs> That's the job. More staff. More administrators. How much waste? Yeah, I'll go through these a little quickly. I would say about half the, what we spend is wasted. How much is that? We spend $3 trillion? We're wasting. If we were like Canada, we would spend half as much. One and a half trillion dollars would be saved. $5,000 per person, if we were like Canada. Uh, well, we could cover everyone if we like Canada. It's inherent in the system. Health insurers are not, health care is not like shoes. Health insurers make their profits by restricting access. They do not make profit by selling more. The way you get rich in a health insurance company is by finding people who are going to be sick and getting them to go away. Yeah. You find the sick, the 10% who drive your course, get rid of them. Pick the cherries. The cherries are the young, healthy people. Get them to join your policy. Drop the lemons the people who take thyroid medication, the people who have depression, the people who have disabilities, the people who have had cancer, the people who have diabetes, the people who are overweight, the people who smoke, the people who did smoke, the people whose mothers smoked. 
Get rid of them. Drop the lemons, pick the cherries. And if you don't do that, you're going to go bankrupt. You can be a nice person. You try to do the right thing, but it's not going to work. Good insurance company, you'll attract the sick people, you'll attract the lemons, your costs will go up, you'll have to raise premiums, and then the, the cherries will leave, and you'll only have lemons. Um, you do this and you get rich. Drug companies are rich. You know, drug prices in the United States are 60% higher than the rest of the world, except for the VA. The VA, the only federal agency to bargain with drug companies, has drug prices 41% less than the rest of us pay. Think about it. We could save a lot of money if we were all in the VA. Um, otherwise, health insurance companies are doing very, very well. Their CEOs are doing very, very well. Angela Braley, 21 million. George Paz at Express Script, 59 million. Cigna 13, United Health 49, Aetna 49, and then poor Michael McAllister at Humana. He looks like somebody just punched him in the gut. <laughs> All he has is a measly seven million dollars in pay. Notice I do not say these people earned seven million dollars, 49 million. You know, you guys probably earn what you get paid. I don't know what you can do to earn that much money. Oops, I do know. Get people not to get health care. And that will raise your prices. They call it medical loss when you file a claim and they pay the claim. When you go to the doctor, fill a prescription, that's medical loss. That should tell you what they're really about. Um, the ACA is covering more people, that's all a good thing. But it does, and it restricts some of the worst things the, the insurance industry does. That is a really good thing. This is, it is worth defending the ACA. It is a great step forward. The first time in 50 years that we've done something really positive about healthcare in this country. It's a small step because it does not cover everyone and it does not control costs. Um, the cost controls are ineffective. The act won't work in the long run because it doesn't solve the problems of rising administrative costs and drug prices. Single payer can do that. Single payer will have private delivery. This is not socialism. I'm a socialist. I know socialism when I see it. This is not socialism. <laughs> but it will cover everybody much more cheaply with effective cost controls. Nationally, I'd estimate $592 billion saved from the AC, from a single payer from HR 676 through drug purchasing, save $100 billion, private insurance administration, $200 billion, reducing billing and insurance related costs in provider offices, $221 billion. $600 billion, how much is that? $2,000 per person in the United States, almost. It will, there'll be money needed to implement. $144 billion through increased utilization when we do away with co-pays. We could call this a cost or we could call it a benefit. Because this is people going to the doctor and not dying. $110 billion to cover everybody. Everybody, meaning people who will not be covered by the ACA. And $90 billion to pay doctors who take Medicaid patients the same as other doctors. Not bad. Um, fair to them, make it easier for the Medicaid people to get doctors. You don't have to wait for the federal government to act. Will it act? Oh, Christ. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. You know, it's only going to get worse. You know, no, 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 that's not going to happen. The Republicans are not going to capture the Senate, so I just don't say that. But you, Oregon can lead the way. Starting in 2017, states can implement their own alternatives to the ACA, provided they cover at least as many people at no more expense. Single payer in Oregon can definitely do that. Here's Oregon, $8.4 billion savings next year if you had single-payer in Oregon, which you can't have next year. So why did I do 2015? 
Nobody was paying me for this, so I just did what I like. And you know, in some ways, it's easier to do a more recent year. You don't have to extrapolate as far in the future. OK, 3.4 billion through reduced provider administration, 1.5 billion by reducing the cost of getting rid of the cost of administering the healthcare system, $2 billion through reduced market power of drug pri prescription drug prices. Oops, there we go. OK. You'll be putting money back in the system. Since Oregon's doing a really good job compared to other states, you already have Medicaid rate equalization, so there's no cost there. This makes it easier, you know, because you've already, you're already doing a lot of the right things. Almost everybody will be insured by next year because of the ACA, and you're already doing a good job on insurance before that. You know, you can pat yourselves on the back. You may, oh, by doing the right thing, you've made it easier to make that next step. Just like the ACA will make it easier to make the next step to single payer, what you've been doing in Oregon with good coverage, fair uh, uh, pricing of Medicaid services, will make it easier to make the next step. The big thing is do away with co-pays and deductibles, you'll have $2 billion in increased utilization. Again, you could call that a cost or you could call it a benefit because that is where people will be getting the health care they need instead of dying. Um, over time, single payer will allow increased savings by getting rid of the things that have been going up the fastest, controlling drug prices and controlling administration. You get rid of the things that have been driving costs up. So you control those and costs won't go up as fast. Here's under the ACA for Oregon. You start, now, 2015, you'll save $6 billion. Over time, the ACA cost will rise faster than costs under single payer. So by 2024, you'll be saving $20 billion. $6 billion, how much is that in Oregon? Over $1,500 per person. $20 billion in 2024, how much is that? There'll be 4 million people in Oregon then, maybe, maybe 6 million people if you have single payer, maybe 10 million, everybody will move here. <laughs> Yeah. You all have to put up that sign that Tom McCall wanted to put up. Visit, but don't stay. Yeah, yeah. But you'll be talking about $4,000 in savings per person. Yeah. I mean, it's a good thing now. It's a better thing later. And that's just the savings. We're not counting the value of human lives. If you value, let's say you reduce mortality by 10000 and you value each life at $4 million a person, you know, comparable to you know, the 9-11 you know, compensation fund. Four million times 10,000, anybody want to do the math? What's that, $40 billion a year in savings? Yeah. Not, and that's not even counting the pain and suffering and all that. I mean, it's like, that's just dollars. I'm an economist, that's all we talk about anyway, so, okay. Fairness, it will be fairer because you won't be victimizing the sick and the poor by the payment system. Instead, health care costs will be borne. You know, you, there are lots of different ways you can do this. But whatever you do, if you shift from a lump sum payment to a tax related to income, income, payroll, ability to pay, then you will be shifting the burden of health care costs from the poor and the sick to the well-off and the, and the healthy. You know, of course, if you're well-off and healthy, earning 300000 you might be pissed that you'll be paying another 10% of your income. You know, it's like, oh, good, I got all this money, I deserve it. Well, maybe you do deserve some of it, but, you know, these guys have had tax cuts. They're the ones who have been benefiting from almost virtually all the economic growth in the United States in the last 20 years has gone to the richest 10%. Most of it has gone to the richest one-tenth of 1%, sorry, one one-hundredth of 1%, which is 30,000 Americans who now own 12% of the United States. 30,000 Americans, 10,000 families. Okay, anyway, that's another, that's another topic. Uh, but here, depending on whether you do it a flat tax or a progressive tax, the poor will get 10, will save 10 plus percent of their income. 
middle class people will be saving, and the rich will be paying more. Um, the average worker in Oregon earns $44,000. Right now, between premiums and deductibles, this average worker with the average health care cost pays $11,000 in health care. That will go down by $7,000 under single payer, under one type of single payer plan. Um, it will create jobs, lower cost to businesses, businesses will flourish. Oregon businesses will be able to undersell those evil companies in Massachusetts. You know, we compete with you, and we usually win. You know, <laughs> you know we have more biotech, we have more software. You know, um, you know, you'll be able to put us in our place. <laughs> Eighty thousand jobs. It can. It's going to be tough because the health insurance and in look, George Paz alone will put $30 million into stopping you. But you have people. We outnumber them. Yes. And we can win. Thank you very much. Uh, the most important thing I got out of this evening was to understand this is doable. In fact, it's very doable if we concentrate on communicating person to person neighbor to neighbor, uh, church member to church member, business person to business person, we'll get it done maybe in 2016 instead of 2017. I would echo what, what he said too about uh, it's doable and um, I actually got more committed to or inspired to make something happen earlier instead of allowing the limit of 2017 hang over our heads. Let's get it done now.